so what's in today's talk for you? Why are you sat here? Why are you listening to Rob Spence waffle on? Well, I want to give you some some ideas. Some of the things we're going to cover in here, maybe things you already know, some things you already implement in your business. Some of them could be fresh ideas. I want to give you some inf- inspiration, some workable concepts. And of course, I want to give you all some key takeaways that you can go in action today so that if we were to have a conversation this time in April, you'll say, Rob, I've increased my sales. Thank you so much. Here's a thousand pound for your time. That's hopefully where we're where we're going to get to. Obviously, that's not contractually obliging, just to make you all aware. Um, but if you do do it, it'd be lovely. Um, before I do go on, I do want to share a little bit about me. So I want to make very clear as to who I am. My I've just had a coffee delivered as well. Thank you very much. Look at that. How good's that? You know, I don't mean to brag, but world's best boss mug over here as well. That wasn't. That wasn't planted on purpose, but it just happens. Um, So a little bit about me. My name is Rob Spence. As I said earlier, I now own a company called Paragon Cell Solutions, but it's taken a while for me to get here. I actually, at the age of 18, had a very short career in Leicestershire Constabulary. At the time, I was still one of the youngest people to play for their rugby team at the time. I'm not too sure if I I, I still am or not. Um, I had a great fun career in there, taught me a lot at a young age. I then went into retail sales for a little while um, and then had a a full on change of career uh, and went into warehousing and operations. I still hold forklift licenses for counterbalance and reach trucks. So if any of you got any pallets to move, let me know. I'll be straight down there. We can we can sort that out for you. Um, I then joined the sales team of that business. And um, what we soon recognized with, within that business was that our depot, we were a depot of eight nationwide, and our depot was outperforming all of the sales, um, the sales teams nationwide. The people above me blamed me for this in a positive manner, of course. And I was then tasked and promoted to go ahead and um, coach and train and mentor the other teams up and down the country. I got to sort of around my, I think it was my 27th birthday, and I I foolishly decided to write a book on sales called Relationship Selling. And here's me thinking only my mum would buy a copy or at least a couple of copies. Um, But it went far better and and more worldwide than I could have ever anticipated. So I had a lot of people asking me for help and support on sales. So I thought, wait, hey, there's potentially a career here. There's potentially a business. Let's give it a go. And here we are. I also own and operate the Less Year Business Network Group, which is a, a physical networking event, um, which is held once a month. We had one last night, actually. And of course, we're not prejudiced on areas or shires. If you're from any other shire than Leicester Shire, do let me know. You're always welcome to come and attend. But enough about me. Let's start talking about you. Who here in the room loves to sell? I can't see many of your hands, but it might be nice to get some some nods. Yeah, okay, I can see a couple of a couple of hands. Some hands are still uh, 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 sort of below the cameras, which is all fine. But we all know, we all know that sales is, in my opinion, probably the most important part of any business. Yeah, of course, there's a lot of different elements to every business that's important. You know, we need our operations, we need our HR. But fundamentally, if we're not making sales, we've not got the money to invest in those in those aspects. So we've always got to remember that sales is very, very important for any business and should, in my opinion, be probably one of the most uh, prioritized parts to, to one's day job. One thing I always like to remind people as well is that in this day and age, sales and marketing are much closer than I believe they ever have been before. I think there's that old adage, isn't there, that, you know, sales are over here. The marketing team are over here or the activities are completely different. And, you know, there's always that mismatch of communication and the sales team aren't closing the marketing leads and so on and so forth. But not only as a salesperson, but also as a business owner or an entrepreneur, I think what we're noting in this modern day of selling is that sales and marketing activities are now pretty much as one. And we're going to touch upon some of those very soon. Just a little check of time. 20 minutes left, guys. You're hanging in well. Well done. Don't worry. We're still all all right. So. Let's crack on. So with this speech, I've tried to nail down this into sort of four sections, every a little action to take every week. Of course, I'd recommend that you do sort of make notes. So please do jot away if you can take some screenshots, take some photos on your phone. What I've tried to do is piece together four weeks worth of activities, things that you can do. Won't necessarily cost you anything, but will. And I guarantee this will help you increase your sales. And the reason I know that they will is because these are all tried and tested techniques that we use both here for Paragon, but also for the clients that we work with. So as we move on to week one, what we need to do is formulate our sales targets. Right. I'm still I'm trying to try my best to look at a couple of you. Let's be honest. Who here has set sales targets for the year or for the month? 
Okay, a few hands. Oh, I'm just scrolling across. Okay, pretty, pretty much everyone, I think, just scrolling across. When I work with a lot of businesses, entrepreneurs, salespeople, it, it does still astound me that many people don't have sales targets set in. And I think there's a couple of reasons for that. And I won't sort of pick out pick out people. But it's something that even we as a business have done before. We've not set targets and we've not truly monitored them. However, it's very, very important that we do. I don't need to sort of patronize you and tell you the reasons why that we need to do. However, if we don't have anything to aim for, if we don't have anything to record, at the end of these four weeks, how are we going to know if we've actually hit any targets? How do we know if we've increased our sales? So I do urge you to make a note today. And even if you just spend half an hour, 15 minutes, an hour if you can afford it, this week, sit down and truly look at your numbers. Truly look at how much money you want to make this year. How much money in sales? How much revenue do you want to generate? Of course, you can go a step further and break things down into you know, uh, net profits and so on and so forth. But Let's try and keep it simple. Let's write a figure. Let's put it on a board somewhere and let's work together on how we're going to achieve that. Now, one big um, piece of advice I'll give to any salesperson, whether they're new or experienced, is to always break your targets down. I don't know about yourself, but talking from personal experience, sometimes seeing a big, scary sales figure, no matter what it is, whether it's a thousand pound, whether it's a hundred thousand pound, can be very off poor off-putting. It can be daunting. It can be too hard to achieve, right? It's no different saying, John, I want you to run a marathon next year. All of a sudden in your head, you're thinking, what? 26 miles. I can see him shaking his head. 26 miles, 26.1 miles. I can't achieve that. However, if we can break those down, if we can break these targets down into smaller, more manageable chunks, it becomes all of a sudden a lot easier. And another thing every other business owner and salesperson must do is truly understand your figures and your KPIs, your key performance indicators. And we'll kind of break those down again together now. So when we're talking about our sales targets, there's a couple of sort of key, key indicators that we want to truly understand, the, the ones that we truly want to get to the bottom of so that we know when we're going to make a difference. And the great thing about doing this is instead of looking at that big sales target, that big number that scares us, as soon as we break them down, we know that just a small increase can soon add up. So this little um, list of um, sort of KPIs on the left here, we've got understanding your leads, conversion rates, transaction, average spend, and your profit margins. I'd say are probably the five of the key things that I'd urge any business owner to understand and get their head around. First of all, we need to understand how many leads we're generating in a week, in a month, in a year, in a day, maybe. We also need to understand our own conversion rate. Now, conversion rate tracking is something that we've only, to be honest with you, only really started to do simply because of time. But once again, we need to break down our actions within our sales process to understand what areas of improvement we need to do and how can we improve that conversion rate. So for argument's sake, if we're getting 10 leads in and we're converting five of those leads in sales, we'll know that we've got a 50% conversion rate. I'm not gonna do any other examples because my maths is atrocious and I'll only embarrass myself. So we're gonna to stick to the 10 to five principle on that one. It's also very important to understand what your general transaction rates are, whether that's your average spend, or also the average spend per, per customer. And of course, we do need to understand our profit margins. If we can get our head around these KPIs, it does take a bit of a while to track, and I can give you some little hints and tips on how to understand those. All of a sudden, we can understand how just a small increase in leads maybe a small increase in transactions, maybe a small increase in your profit margin will soon add to your yearly target. And now if we look to the, to the right-hand side of, of the slide, um, what I mentioned earlier is it's very important that we break our overall target down. Of course, the easiest way we can do this is to look at daily, weekly, and monthly revenue targets. As I said earlier, all of a sudden, 120,000 yearly sales figure breaks down nicely into, you know, 12,000, quick maths there, Robert. So is that right? No, it's not right, is it? Let's move on from that. Um, 10, 10,000, thank you, John. I'm so glad you're here. 10,000 pounds, that becomes our monthly target, okay, and so on and so forth. Uh, once again, before that big target becomes a small target. And as, as I always say to my team here, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. Every marathon starts with just one step. If we look at the overall target and it overwhelms us, panics us, makes us procrastinate, which I think sometimes happens in sales, right? We all know we do it. By breaking those targets down, it becomes a lot more manageable. Now, one of the key things you can ever do to help you manage all these um, is to invest in a CRM system. 
There's a lot of CRM systems out there in the world. There's a lot of open source ones. There's a lot of uh, sector specific uh, CRM systems. We could have a whole discussion for half an hour on the best CRM systems on the on the planet. We are partnered with one here. This The one on the screen is one called Set for Business. If you do want a demo, do let, let me know. My email address is on the screen there. I'll organize a demo for you. But any CRM system, whether you use HubSpot, Pipedrive, Zoho, Salesforce, or even Set for Business, they will allow you to track your leads, help you track your KPIs and run reports. They allow you to plan and just ensure that nothing is missed. They'll ensure that if you send a proposal to Jim, on a Thursday, you can set yourself reminders to follow up with Jim the following Monday and so on and so forth. If you don't want to invest in a CRM system, if you feel that you can't for whatever reason, please do just invest in an Excel spreadsheet. All CRM systems are fundamentally a, a, a spreadsheet behind the scenes. Get open a spreadsheet, manage your leads, track your performance, manage yourself, and I assure you those sales will start to, start to ramp up. So now we're looking at week two. OK, this is now where we get to get some really exciting stuff down. Now, whenever anyone comes to me and it happens quite a lot, Rob, how do I get more sales? There's always sort of two two key ways that we're going to get them straight away. One is by attracting new clients. We know that we want new business coming into our realm, into our realm, into our universe. So we want to target new clients. My first exercise will always be formulate a target list. Come up with a hit list, whether that's a list of 50 people. 100 people, 2,000 people, of course, make it manageable for yourself. Make yourself a target list. Now, that target list can just be off the top of your head. You could look at, you know, the top 100 businesses within Gloucestershire, for argument's sake, and think they're the ones I'm going to target. You could look at more um, specific targets for what you're best at. If you find that your niche are restaurants, create a target list of 100 restaurants, the people that you truly want to work with. The next thing you want to do is to set up a sales process to attract and speak to those individuals. Once again, I could talk about sales processes until the cows come home. A simple sales process will always involve various touch points with your prospects so that they get the most conversations from you, so you can develop a relationship and fundamentally so you can carry on the conversation. Some of the best ways you can do that are telephone calls. Never, never neglect what good a telephone call can do for you. Believe me, telephone sales still works we generated 20 leads for a client just last week all via the telephone so cold calling does still work be sure to send your prospects emails try and booking meetings and don't neglect social media as well but fundamentally the key thing that you want to do is to get yourself out there one of the key sort of measures of success i've ever seen for any business or salesperson is the sooner they start actually getting themselves out there and putting their necks on the line all of a sudden their success rate goes up and their sales go up. And that can be doing anything such as today, joining a great networking event, joining a great networking group, getting yourself involved. And that goes beyond a Zoom meeting, a physical meeting. That goes onto the wonderful group on Facebook that Rachel's put together, you know, joining the conversation on there. Rachel was wrapping my knuckles earlier because I, I don't involve myself in the group so much. And that will be addressed. Don't you worry. But there's great groups out there that, that you can get your name and face out there. Try and do similar things to what I'm doing now. Get speaking events done. Um, the more the more you get yourself out into the world, I assure you, the more prospect lists you'll grow, the more conversations you'll have, the more knock-on conversations will happen, and you will get more business. The other thing you can do while looking for new client, uh, get more sales, is to talk to your existing clients. There's great ways and great techniques that you can do to speak to your existing clients. If anything, I'd say speaking to existing clients is potentially easier than finding new business because there's a relationship there, there is trust there, and they're more likely to be receptive to whatever it is you're trying to sell if done in an ethical way. So once again, we can look for cross-selling opportunities. So are there any related or you know complementary products or services that someone's taking from you that you can then cross-sell onto them? Or are you able to upsell your services? Have they taken a service or product for you? And can you offer them a higher end product or service, obviously for a bit more revenue? The other great thing, oh, a little story to share with you actually, is I've put on here, I don't know if you can see that, sometimes five pound can equate to one million. Whilst I was selling fine food and ingredients, one of the key tasks I was tasked with was generating an extra one million pound of revenue across the group, one million pound. And they wanted that within a year. And what I soon discovered is that 
I tracked the amount of telephone calls we were having with our existing clients, once again, per year, per month, per week, and per day. I worked out the um, average spend that we'd have to upsell or even cross-sell to these individuals. And it only worked out that every conversation we had with a client, we only had to sell to them an extra five pounds worth of products. Considering we were selling everything from, I was, it was a fine food supply, I don't know if I told you, but we, we were selling anything from boxes of butter, which were, you know, 30, 40 pound, give or take, selling, you know, full on, um, you know, joints of beef that was sometimes 120 pound. All of a sudden that five pound seems achievable, right? So just to go back to an early example where I was talking about sales targets, when my boss said to me, Rob, we need to get an extra one million pound, I about died. I've not seen a million pound, not even in Monopoly. And it terrified the hell out of me. However, as soon as we broke those targets down, worked out it was just five pound per conversation, we could get an extra million pound. It became a lot easier. Um, it's also very worthwhile speaking to former clients as well. And this is why having a CRM system, a database is very worthy. Of course, sometimes it can be a little bit awkward speaking to former clients whom potentially things didn't end with on good terms, should we say. However, it doesn't mean you still can't engage the conversation. It still doesn't mean you can't reach out to them to see how things have been. It takes a lot. It takes a lot to maybe sort of take the confidence to give those individuals a call or an email. However, if you feel that you're now in a position to maybe do a better service or re-engage that individual, what's stopping you speaking to them? It could be that they've stopped working with you because at the time they didn't have the budget for you anymore. Or perhaps they were just exploring other options. For the sake of a five-minute conversation of saying, Hey, Julie, listen, I know we've not spoken in a while. How's business? How, what's going on? Hey, listen, what, I know we used to do this for you. You're still looking into that kind of thing. And boom, you, you start the conversation that way. And we all know one of the best things you can ever do um, to generate more sales is to ask for referrals. Hands up, who's asking your current prospects, your customers for referrals? A couple of hands. Great. I don't need to preach too much on this. What we soon learn, these are recent statistics I pulled off the Tinder web. So normally one out of 20 prospects will, will buy from you, normally a cold prospect. So it's a, a decent statistic. However, one out of six referred prospects will buy from you or are more likely to buy from you. And as you can see, the statistics there, normally when a customer is referred to you, you've got a longer chance of retention and a higher chance of them referring to them to you. Now, I get asked a lot of uh, the question of, Rob, when, when should I ask for the referral? How, you know, how, how do I approach that? It's always a tough one. And it, it does happen on a personal level. You have to make sure that your relationship with that individual is at an all-time high. Uh, the best way I describe it in my head is I see it as a thermometer. You want to ask them whilst that relationship is at sort of like boiling point in a positive way. If it's dipping off for whatever reason, it soon becomes harder. The worst thing you can ever do is do a really bad job for someone and say, hey, listen, have you got a referral? I'd love to do some business with your friends because it doesn't work. I'm a very optimistic salesperson and there's just no point. It doesn't work. However, if you've done a great job for someone and they're ranting and raving, and say, this is a genius. I love your product. I love your service. Listen, I know I really appreciate your feedback. Thanks so much. Listen, is there anyone else in your in your black book? Is there anyone else in your networks that could benefit from what it is I'm delivering? A simple question like that, half the time you'll get their black book and they'll say, yes, you need to speak to X, Y, and Z. At the end of the day, what's the worst can happen? They say, sorry, I've got no one to speak to. Not a problem at all. At least you've tried. So on to week three. Oh gosh, is that five minutes left? Cool, blimey. Um, we won't spend too long on, on, on sort of social selling. Um, so we do a lot of work on in the digital digital realms as well as sort of the, the analog realms, as I call them, the, the telesales and face-to-face -face sales. But we all know the importance of social media. And there's a lot of reasons why it is. You can do some fancy things on social media, which I won't have time to go into now. But on a personal level is it helps to break down barriers. Now, what I always sort of coach and teach and, and train is, and mentor is that, a lot of sales are built on trust. People buy from people. We always use the same hairdresser. We always use the same car mechanic normally because we get to know and like people. The great thing about social media is it breaks down those barriers of trust so that people can get to know you way before you ever even have a conversation with them. There's loads of social media platforms out there, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, TikTok, to name but a few. What I'll always say to anyone is don't think that you've got to limit yourself to the one 
platform where you think your target audience is. Because my argument is, we and we discuss this with a lot of our social media clients, they say, oh, I don't want to do any marketing on TikTok because, because um, my, my target audience aren't on there. Oh, okay, who you, who's your target audience? Managing directors. I've got TikTok. I use TikTok. I know a lot of people who use TikTok. It's the same with Instagram, Facebook. There's a lot going on on these platforms that you need to be a part of. The free platforms, yes, it takes time to create the content. Yes, sometimes it might take some money to pay someone to make the content, but it's better to be on there. It's always better to attract as opposed to push people away with over-sales and messages. I mean, we don't need a show of hands, but I bet my bottom dollar, at least each of you this week on LinkedIn have had an automated message from someone saying, hey, great to connect. I'd love to talk to you about my product and service because it's absolutely amazing. When can we book in? And I bet you then get an automated follow-up within three days, right? And once again, I will bet a tenor that none of you responded to one of those messages and gone, actually, yeah, I can't wait to speak to this person. It sounds like a great laugh. I, I don't think, if there are, please do drop a comment into the chat box. It'd be great to, to see what's going on there. The best way to operate on social media, in my opinion, is to attract. Don't push away, be a magnet, attract people in by showing good, value-worthy content. And one key thing before I move on quickly is don't be afraid of the camera. The camera both photographic and video is ama amazing right now. Video is the best way to break down those barriers. As well, I read, I think last month, that this is where I get really technical and boring, so please do bear with me. Google are currently in talks with both TikTok and Instagram Reels to index um, short form videos. So for, from an SEO, search engine optimization point of view, those short form videos are a great tool that you should be jumping on now so that by the time they're indexed, i.e. when someone searches financial advisors near me or, you know, how do I save money on my, my pension or so on and so forth. Those short form videos that you're creating will soon be picked up by Google as well as on those individual platforms. So don't neglect video. Now, finally, on to week four, and um, I know I'm, I'm getting conscious of time now. Don't forget to practice and refine your sales skills. Selling is no different to riding a bike. It's no different to throwing a ball. It's no different to combing your hair. I don't, that's not a skill, is it? It is for me. Look at it. Um, but you've got to practice. You've got to refine. And you've got to hone those skills. Maybe make some notes. I've, I've put sort of, uh, what are there, five five key skill sets that I think any salesperson or business owner should get their head around. Unfortunately, we won't have time to go into those today. But as a salesperson, as an entrepreneur, as a business owner, we need to be looking at prospecting skills, relationship development, closing techniques, objection handling, and also being able to seek out referrals and repeat business, which to me encompasses account management. Um, there's loads of ways you can do that. Obviously, attending seminars by lovely sales trainers like myself is a great start. There's plenty of videos on YouTube um, and reading books is a great thing. This happened to appear in my slide deck. I'm not too sure how it happened. It's frozen now, so I can't move it on. But these are just three of the books I've written. They're all available on, on Amazon. If you do wish to buy one, please do head on over there. But in each of these books, it's, they're full of useful information on skill set, mindset, and uh, everything that you need to become a better salesperson. Uh